Good evening, or is it, um, I don't know, good late afternoon? It's five o'clock, I never quite know that to say good evening or good afternoon. However, as you know, it's here at Church at Five right now. A hearty welcome, whether you're a regular worshipper that actually comes here, well, pre-coronavirus comes here week by week, um, or if you're somebody who's tuning in, either in Australia or maybe further afield, um, wherever you are and whoever you are, we do hope that you really feel at home here with us during our service. And I trust you'll be blessed as we reflect upon our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. I do have, I think, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, next Sunday, our morning service and this service will recommence actually in church. Both services will also be streamed via the same method we've been using as of lately. So next Sunday, 5th of July, we at Church at Five can see one another here face to face, uh, and that'll be just fantastic, won't it, to all be together again. There will be a couple of things like, I think, a signing in procedure, but when you get here, you'll kind of be told what to do uh, and maybe where to sit as well. Um, so that's some good news um, for next Sunday. But please don't forget to read at home your bulletins, which I think most of you have this by email every week, uh, because it does have other um, things to reflect on and to, to know about. So please always check your emails as well for uh, precise information. The other announcement is that the Wednesday evening Zoom prayer meeting has been going on uh, virtually, I think, every Wednesday evening during this time we've not been meeting in church. And so that's on again this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. The Zoom info for our St. Andrew's prayer meeting is online, uh, the information you're getting on your emails. And it would be great to have a few more of you joining in for prayer. We pray about a, mat a, a variety of different things we pray about. So please um, join us if you can. And if you have any problems with the technical stuff, which I usually do, um, contact uh, Gareth or Helen Rowe, and they can then send the link to you on that night if there's a problem. That's the announcements over with. You'll be glad to know. Uh, we're just going to read a few verses from one of the Psalms. It's actually Psalm 89. You know, sometimes when I have my devotional time and my prayer time, um, it's also good, I think, to start off just praising the Lord, not asking for anything or not even necessarily thanking him, just praising him for who he is. And I always find in the Psalms, there's so many verses there that gives you phrases and words uh, to adore God and, and Jesus with. And so um, I always find it's very helpful to start off with a, a quick psalm. So I'm going to do some verses from Psalm 89, verses 5 to 8, and a few verses later on. So Psalm 89, verse 5 to 8. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. And then just verses 14 and 15. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O oh Lord, in the light of your face. So I think it's just time now for us to just have an opening prayer before we resume the rest of our church service. Let's just pray. O oh, loving God, we come before your throne of grace and mercy. We accept that of ourselves we are unclean in your sight. Therefore, thanks be to you, God, for the gift of Jesus Christ, so that we can come with confidence, approach you as a holy God, one who is everlasting. God, you are everywhere at all times, and you watch over us. Lord, we are going to be thinking tonight about following you, but following you closely, whatever the cost, no excuses. May we all be challenged about our commitment and loyalty to you 
show us where we may be in error and show us more and more how we should truly live lives that honour and please you. Amen. This is my This evening's Bible reading is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let, let me first go to bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first lay my farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the to the plough and looks back as fit for the kingdom of God. This is the reading of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, righteous Lord Jesus, and Holy Spirit, thank you for your unfailing love on the cross. You know what it is to suffer extreme pain physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Even though the world is still full of trouble, we know that we can always trust you and find peace and hope and victory in you, for you have overcome the world. Your love is greater than this universe. We are truly blessed because you are our Savior and our best friend. We present our whole church into your sovereign hand. Bless our minister all the leaders and all the volunteers of this church to continue to serve you with your mighty power and grow this church with your guidance. As we transition into live services on next Sunday, 5th of July, please bless us all to worship you wholeheartedly in unity, in spirit and in truth and enjoy the fellowship with one another. Australia and even the whole world have indeed suffered great loss. May you comfort all those who are sad, lonely, and lost in the world. Be their shelter and be their strength. 
for those who are sick or not well, we intercede for them in our hearts and thoughts. In your mercy, heal them and they will be healed. Save them and they will be saved. Deliver them, they shall be set free. Thank you, Lord, that to live is Christ and to die is gain. We have nothing to fear because you are our eternal King. Grant every government who follows your heart, your wisdom, strategies, compassion and humility to stand as leaders in the global arena that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Please bring peace and godly resolution in every conflict of every nation. Protect everyone from all kinds of viruses and diseases. Lead us not into any temptation whatsoever, but deliver us from all harm and all evil. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm sure you have often heard people talk about converts to Christianity. They say, there were many converts at the Billy Graham Crusade in Sydney in 1959. It's interesting that Jesus never once talked about making converts. He never asked his disciples to make converts. Jesus often talked about discipleship. He called people to be his disciples and commanded his 12 disciples to go into all the world and make disciples. 
not converts. David Watson, in his classic book called Discipleship, wrote this. I have a growing conviction that discipleship is one of the main issues for today. The Christian church has largely neglected the thrust of the Great Commission to make disciples. The result is that other religions and political groups have led the way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who opposed the Nazi regime, said, When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Not every Christian is called to martyrdom, as Bonhoeffer was, but every Christian is called to discipleship, whatever the personal cost may be. The concept of discipleship wasn't new when Jesus called people to follow him. In the New Testament, we have reference to the disciples of the Mosaic Law and of John the Baptist. So the basic concept of discipleship was widely accepted by the time Jesus was beginning his ministry. When Jesus started to gather around him a mixed crowd of ordinary people, it soon became obvious that he was creating a radical and unique pattern of discipleship. Jesus called people to himself not just to his teaching. He demanded their total obedience. Jesus warned people that if they followed him, they would have to suffer. He never promised an easy life to those who followed him. If you are going to follow Jesus, you must be acutely aware that it will mean having to accept the full demands that he clearly makes. Jesus was so honest about the cost of discipleship that many of the enthusiastic crowds who followed him turned back and no longer went with him. The three years of Jesus' ministry hadn't been particularly fruitful in terms of sheer numbers following him. It's not hard to see why. To those who wanted to join his group, he spelt out the cost of discipleship in unambiguous terms. We see this illustrated in the meetings Jesus had with three would-be disciples. And we have the record of these meetings in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62, the passage that Alethea read to us earlier in the service. Tonight, we complete our series on people who met Jesus. As Jesus walked along the road in the direction of Jerusalem, aware that the cross awaited him, three men separately announced their willingness to follow him. Each man was clearly well-intentioned, but none of them had any realization of the full implications of discipleship. They were what we might describe as willing disciples, but. Notice, first of all, the man who was too sure. The first man expressed his readiness to follow Jesus wherever it would lead. Verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. 
It was a generous offer. He really meant what he said. He genuinely wanted to be a disciple of Jesus. His intention is remarkable because Matthew in his gospel tells us that this man was a scribe. The scribes were well known for their hostility towards Jesus. But this particular scribe, he wanted to follow Jesus. Jesus' reply implies that the man hadn't reckoned with what was involved if he followed Jesus. He was unaware that Jesus was moving on towards a cross. His intention wasn't soundly based. He saw crowds, miracles, and lots and lots of enthusiasm. He seemed to think it would be trendy and popular to be associated with Jesus. But Jesus warned him where his obedience would eventually lead to. In worldly terms, it would mean a life of constant uncertainty and insecurity. Even animals and birds have settled places of habitation. But this wasn't the case with Jesus. He didn't know where his next meal was coming from or where he would spend the night. Jesus wandered from place to place. There was no room for him in the inn. Judea rejected him. Galilee cast him out. Samaria refused to give him lodging. We must understand the implications of discipleship. It involves complete surrender, self-denial, sacrifice, service, and suffering. Spiritual warfare is inevitable. We have to expect to face hatred, slander, and opposition from the world. For some Christians, it means persecution. J.C. Ryle once wrote, If we are not ready to take part in the afflictions of Christ, we must never expect to share his glory. Notice, secondly, the man who was too slow. The second man was invited by Jesus, verse 59. In response to Jesus' invitation, the man asked for leave to bury his father. His request was to stay at home until his father died. This meant an indefinite delay. Jesus couldn't wait because he was on his way to Jerusalem. In normal circumstances, it is good that we should have a home of our own in which we can perform our acts of filial piety to our loved ones whether in life or in death, and show affection to our relations and friends. All this is part of family life, which God has appointed for us. Nevertheless, we must always be prepared to sacrifice security, duty, and affection if we are to respond 
to the call of the kingdom. A call so urgent and imperative that all other loyalties must give way before it. Career missionaries have to do this. And they know that this is very costly. J.B. Caird wrote, The most difficult choices in life are not between the good and the evil, but between the good and the best. Notice finally, the man who was too soft. The third man, like the first, offered his services. Verse 61. The man interposed a condition that he first say farewell to those at his home. This condition seems to us perfectly reasonable. His request, however, concealed some reluctance within him to take the decisive step. Jesus points out that the kingdom has no room for people who look back when they are called to go forward. He uses an agricultural illustration to emphasize his point. Verse 62, Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The commentator Jeremiah has this little explanation on verse 62. The very light Palestinian plough is guided with one hand. This one hand, generally the left, must be at the same time keep the plough upright regulate its depth by pressure and lift it over the rocks and stones in its path. The plowman uses the other hand to drive the unruly oxen with a goad about two yards long, fitted with an iron spike. At the same time, he must continually look between the hind quarters of the oxen keeping the furrow in sight. This primitive kind of ply needs dexterity and concentrated attention. If the plowman looks round, the new furrow becomes crooked. Thus, whoever wishes to follow Jesus must be resolved to break every link with the past and fix his eye only on the coming kingdom of God. As we come to the end of this series, I want to ask you this question. Will you decide to follow Jesus, whatever the cost? Remember, it will mean defying peer pressure. It will involve placing your loyalty to Jesus over everything else, even the family you love. A Christian song puts it like this, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back.
Maybe you are a willing disciple, but are you too sure? Are you too slow? Are you too soft? Why not start to follow Jesus tonight on his terms? Amen. And now we're going to sing our final song. Very appropriate words for our theme tonight and our meditation. I will follow. And I trust that you will indeed follow Jesus, even as you sing these words. But remember the cost that is involved. Let's sing these words together. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us tonight, for your invitation to each one of us to follow you. But we know that following you comes at a cost. So help us in the quietness of these moments as we come to the end of our service that we will think through the implications of what it will mean to follow you. Help us to be willing to make the sacrifices we need to make in order to become your disciples. And may from this night we follow you wherever you take us, and whatever the cost may be. So go with us now on this journey, and may your grace and love and mercy go with us right until our journey's end. Amen. <laughs>